Good morning on the West Coast, good afternoon on the East Coast, and good evening to my friends in Europe and the UK. Uh, I'm Tom Strange, uh, Artistic Director and Chief Curator for the Sigel Music Museum, and I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, if I might, first let me introduce my guest artist. So this is Lisa Lee Kaiser. Come on in, Lisa, just so that uh, we remember we're socially distancing. Uh, Lisa is uh, principal uh, uh, keyboardist for the Greenville Symphony Orchestra. Uh, you know, teaches here locally and has agreed to come in and be our guest artist today as we go through these instruments. So let me talk a little bit about the two that we have. These are both from the Marlowe Sigel uh, uh, keyboard instrument collection. Uh, as you guys know, Marlo uh, had an interest in keyboards and woodwinds, and we have this wonderful array of uh, that collection to bring forward to you and show you. Uh, these are two of my favorites. Uh, they're, they're absolute gems of the collection, uh, and again, they, they just sort of dem demonstrate that discriminating taste that uh, Marlo had when he was looking for instruments. So, We'll start with the, the earliest one here. This one is from approximately 1660, uh, Italian, uh, Bologna, um, if, or, or somewhere very close to there in, in northern Italy is where we think this came from. Um, it has a lot going for it. Uh, Marlowe had bought uh, an Italian harpsichord from about the same period, uh, back in uh, 1984. Uh, it had some issues, as some of these early harpsichords do, some of which were just you know, extensive reworking by people. So he was looking for something a little bit more fully original, and boy did he find one, because this one is one of those harpsichords where it never saw most of the things that, that go on. In other words, uh, typically with a compass as small as this, three and a half octaves, uh, as Lisa discovered uh, you know, as she began to play, you know, very little music past about 1700 really fits on such an instrument. And so typically they would enlarge these things and uh, the, the revealments, uh, you know, changing the way they were disposed. This one saw only one small thing at one point, and I'll come around on this side and just show, this is the bridge. And this bridge was actually brought back away from the front of the instrument so that it could be strung in steel. Well, that's nice and you can actually uh, you know, tune it a little bit higher frequency, but it was meant to be in brass, all brass. And so what happened was, uh, once the instrument kind of fell out of currency, kind of fell out of being used, uh, obviously it was just put in a dank place uh, in the estate in Italy where it was, uh, and that's where it essentially was found and, and brought up for auction. So, uh, although the woodworms had been very active and this harpsichord was a complete wreck when, when Marlowe bought it, he had it very, very carefully restored and brought forward some wonderful things. So, this is the inside of the lid, and this painting is uh, contemporary with the harpsichord. Uh, this would have been made, uh, again, in the 17th century, uh, probably made for the harpsichord. Uh, I will just show you that at the front of the keyboard, uh, we have these wonderful uh, arcades in ivory as well. Uh, ivory being a little bit of an exclusive thing for uh, an instrument of this time. Normally the keys would be covered in boxwood, but here we've used the more expensive ivory that they're just able to get. So the other thing I wanted to show you was the uh, tops of the accidentals, the sharps. Notice how we have a wedge of ivory uh, inlaid in with the ebony. Uh, this is really extraordinary, and it makes a very interesting looking keyboard. So, happy to have this one. Uh, a few more things about it. Uh, this is the traditional inner outer case. And in, in this harpsichord, this inner instrument lifts completely out of the case as though it were like a guitar case. And you could have set it on a table and played it. By this time, it would be very common for the harpsichord to actually stay in its protective case and be played in that. I'll tell you that for projection, there's nothing like having it actually out of the case and, and able to be heard from all sides because the sides of these are very, very thin. Uh, the whole thing's made of cypress, and so it's a very resonant sort of sound. This one is disposed two by eight, meaning there's two eight-foot strings per note, 
and we don't have any register control, so it's two by eight permanently. It's not meant to be moved back and forth between you know one by eight, two by eight, and it never had a four foot bridge, and that would be common for an instrument of this type. So. Uh, without going on and on, let me bring Lisa in and she's going to play a little bit for you so you can hear what's going on here. Among the instruments that we have, uh, this was, has a, one of the warmest sounds for a harpsichord, and it really kind of brings you in. Uh, as usual, the keyboard is, is quite uh, short, so for the modern uh, keyboardist, it, it's a little intimidating right at first. And then, uh, because we're at uh, our uh, study storage area, uh, you'll notice that uh, all the instruments are on uh, some sort of platform or pedestal. You know, just as good museum practice. Uh, there's one in here in the background that just came in whose uh, platform is being made for it. But uh, it allows us to at least show off the instrument a bit, and then obviously for concert we'll, we'll drop it back down and be able to play it from a seated position like mm -hmm. civilized human beings. But we're going to be understanding today. Uh, I did just want to show briefly, uh, they, they actually painted even the, the uh, lid flap here. So you get you know, these lovely rural scenes of what appears to be northern Italy um, that uh, you know, just kind of speak to this instrument and, and where it came from. Uh, it, Marla went through not only the, having the instrument itself restored uh, by Tim Hamilton in Boston, uh, but uh, had art conservators come in and clean the paintings on the lid Things were quite dark. The varnish had gone uh, very, very brown. And so he effectively spared no expense in bringing this instrument back so that we could really enjoy it. And I think this was a right and proper sort of restoration because it's so visually interesting and you know, the, the dynamic properties of it are, are you know, already there. Uh, Tim Hamilton did a wonderful job, even though the soundboard, and particularly the bridge, was, was riddled with uh, worm damage, uh, the, the borer beetle. He came in and actually filled in all those places, and so we've kept most of the original bridge and all of the original soundboard all put back together, made nice and neat, and quite frankly, uh, this instrument has a long life ahead of it of you know being concertized upon and, and played. So, uh, I think, uh, you know, hats off to Marla for having done that. This is a, uh, a early work uh, by the wonderful French builder Pascal Tascan, uh, built in 1769. It's one of two from that year. The Russell Collection has the uh, other one. Uh, this one uh, perhaps used a little more heavily, uh, and then it saw some fairly invasive restoration work in the middle of the 20th century. Fortunately, they didn't uh, do anything funny with the actual sound components. So we have a, a wonderful soundboard that's uh, essentially in great condition. Uh, we have a case that's in good condition. And the, the two things that they uh, replaced, uh, it had no lid uh, left with it. Something had happened, the lid was, was damaged, destroyed, or lost. And it didn't have a lid. And it didn't, uh, something was wrong with the original keyboard to the point where they thought they should replace the keyboard on this. So this one has what we call a modern replacement keyboard. It's okay, 
Um, it's uh, fine enough for what we're trying to do here. And of course what that means is that we can play it and play it and play it and we're not worrying much of anything out because that part's already been replaced. Uh, otherwise, uh, this one speaks very nicely as a, uh, a great French harpsichord. So, unlike the Italian that I just talked about, uh, this one has a number of ways that we can change the sound. Uh, we can, of course, play on one by eight on the top manual. We have a buff stop on this, a true buff stop, so we can move the bump over and we can play uh, two by eight uh, by playing on the, the bottom uh, keyboard. Lots of different sounds, and of course, remember this one has the shove coupler, so the the upper keyboard can be disengaged. Or re-engaged, as you uh, see fit. Makes for lots and lots of different sonic colors that you can get out of such a harpsichord. And in addition to the sonic colors, notice uh, all this original decoration. So. This is sort of at the height of the French aristocracy. Uh, the soundboard wonderfully painted. And so we have the rose of Pascal Tascan, and we've got this garland of flowers. Uh, this is one of those harpsichords that actually had, you know, a little bit of mythology around it. One of the, the myths was that it started off as a Rutgers and then uh, you know, Blanchet had uh, uh, refurbished it and erased all signs of Rutgers and then Tascan comes in and refurbishes it and erases all signs of Blanchet. But none of that happened. This was originally built by Tascan. He's trying to tell you that all along. And you know, part of this is trying to put together a provenance for such instruments that is really just a stretch of the imagination. Uh, as far as we know, this was never played by or owned by anybody all that particularly famous, uh, but it was obviously in wealthy people's homes for most of its life. And then, uh, you know, just to show another part of the soundboard here, where we have all this lovely, uh, you know, paintings of the roses and garlands. The whole thing is really great, and I hope that you guys can come uh, to the museum and, and actually see this. Uh, it's going to be mounted for exhibition. Uh, you know, later this summer, and so we're really looking forward to people being able to come and, and actually experience it. And then I'm going to get Lisa to come in and play for us a little bit here.
kind of brings you back a little bit when you can hear it like that. And then if you could actually be here, you know, the thing has a, a wonderful deep sound, particularly in the bass. Um, compared to the English harpsichords, uh, you know, gosh, everybody has its own color and its own sound. Uh, I encourage folks to come to the museum and see and hear some of these. And then you, know, you have to make up your own mind. Uh, there's things about the English harpsichords, the, the brightness, the, the presence that I like. And then, you know, this, uh, you know, dark, darker, warmer sound from the French is beautiful. The, the, the little more nasally sound from the Italians, uh, you know, again, all harpsichords, all working the same way with the jack coming up and plucking the string, but with uh, all these various sounds that they have. So it's kind of a reason why you would want to have more than one harpsichord. You might want to have something from you know, each particular building tradition. And I think from the French harpsichord standpoint, there really wasn't a building tradition that was you know, quite the equal of what was going on here. So as you know, you know these harpsichords you know, develop things uh, over time. And although this one uh, might well have had a name board that said Pascal Pascal on the front, this is uh, you know, another one of those things where it's a, it's a modern uh, reproduction, uh, modern meaning, probably when this was restored in 1951 uh, by a Parisian restorer. And what we know from that is that uh, obviously the harpsichord was worth enough to the people at the time that they wanted to spend the money to you know, make a harpsichord work again and so that they could demonstrate it again. And I think you know, there was the revival uh, of the harpsichord back in the early uh, part of the 20th century. Uh, we went through you know, World War II and then after World War II, you know, people are coming back out of it. And they're starting to ask these same questions again. You know, what was the old music like? What did the old sound sound like? And at that point, this harpsichord came out of some form of retirement, where undoubtedly it was not playing at all. And then it was made to to go back into playing condition. And then since Marlowe had it, uh, he had additional work done. All we've done to it uh, to date is tune it and. Quite frankly, most all that it really needs at this point is to simply be tuned uh, and played. Uh, they have replaced the tuning pins, but they did a good job with replacing the tuning pins, and there's nothing particularly funny about them. It's sort of a dream to tune, and it holds its tune very, very well. So here's an example of uh, an artifact in use. Uh, it's been around for a, a long, long time, 250 years uh, last year. And uh, we're still being able to make really great use of it without actually, in my opinion, hurting the harpsichord in any particular way. Well, all right. Well, it's, it's always fun to be bringing these uh, you know, little uh, vignettes to you. Uh, next week, we'll have a couple of more instruments from the sickle collection to talk about. And then uh, perhaps next Friday, uh, we'll see if we can do another one of our, our concerts from the concert series. So uh, thank you all for tuning in today, and we'll be back next Wednesday.